Okay, let's um, <laughs> let's go ahead and get started. I'm Carol Davids. No, uh, Carol was Carol was going to introduce me, but I must have done something wrong earlier this morning because I don't know where she is. Well, it doesn't matter. I can introduce myself. Um, I have the great honor of introducing. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so my name is uh, what's that? Yeah, exactly. Introducing myself. Uh, so my name is Patrick Halley. <clears throat> I'm uh, an attorney. I'm definitely not an engineer. I'm not academic. So as I made a joke earlier, it's kind of questionable why I'm here. Um, actually, I've learned a lot in the last couple of days. So it's been really entertaining to, uh, to uh, be here and learn about technology and what you guys are all doing. So I'm a lawyer. Uh, I work for a law firm in Washington, D.C. called Wilkinson Barker Nauer. We're a communications law firm. Um, we pretty much that's all we do communications primarily federal regulatory kind of work uh, a lot of former FCC people uh, and that's kind of our expertise um, so that's one hat I'm wearing I'm also wearing a hat as the next as the executive director of a nonprofit organization called the next generation 911 Institute and the NG 911 Institute is a 501c3 nonprofit um, educational organization that works on uh, works for and on behalf of the next generation 911 caucus on the hill a lot of caucuses uh, on the Hill. This one is uh, focused on educating members and their staff and other policymakers about what Next Generation 911 is, why it's important, uh, and steps that could be taken, at least at the federal level, to try to advance NG 911. Um, it's uh, Anna Eshoo and actually John Shimkus from Illinois is uh, one of the co-chairs on the House side, and Senator Klobuchar uh, from Minnesota and Senator Burr from North Carolina chair that caucus. Uh, and it's a, it's a good organization, and we put on educational events. We do a technology showcase as part of an event called 911 Goes to Washington in February, uh, where companies can demonstrate uh, different 911 and NG911 technologies, among other things. Um, so I'm wearing that hat. Um, I'm also wearing uh, my former FCC hat. Uh, I didn't start private practice until January of this year. I had just spent about five years at the FCC um, working for Chairman Wheeler not on public safety issues, on broadband policy issues and other, other issues, um, and uh, did that for about five years. And then before that, which I'll talk about in a little bit, I worked for an organization called ComCare, which stood for Communications for Coordinated Assistance in Response to Emergencies. It doesn't exist anymore, um, but it was a pretty neat organization. It, was, it brought together um, industry, so wireless carriers, 911 vendors, um, telematics providers like OnStar with 911, but also police, fire, EMS, trauma docs, emergency surgeons. It was kind of ahead of its time in many ways. It was about how to harness data that all of those different entities would benefit from during an emergency. And that's what I want to talk about today. Um, so I'm wearing all those hats. I don't represent anybody. It's uh, speaking for my own, myself here. And it's nice to be in an event like this where I know everybody's smarter than me. Uh, and I'm, at, at, as the previous keynote speaker said, I'm, I'm cool with that. Um, and it's also interesting to hear what you guys are actually doing. Because normally I talk to a bunch of policymakers and, and government people, and, we, and we, we talk about what can we do to people who are doing stuff. Um, and so it's, it's nice to be at an event where, where people are out there actually doing things and making things happen. OK, so, so what I want to talk about, and it's going to be some repetition, I apologize if you were on the, the first pa panel this morning on NG911, a little bit of repetition, uh, or, and a little bit of repetition with some of the uh, previous discussions in the emergency communications tract. Um, but I think that's okay. So hearing everything that's going on at this conference, on uh, Internet of Things, cloud computing, shared services, uh, WebRTC. I didn't even know what WebRTC was until I got here. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, it's really interesting technology. Um, my, my hope is that we will be able to take advantage of this opportunity, and it's similar to what the, the speaker at the earlier keynote said, that we'll be able to take advantage of this opportunity with all the technology change that's happening now for the benefit of public safety, for the benefit of emergency response. Not just 911. Um, we talk a lot about next generation 911, but I think 911 is just one piece of a broader emergency communications and public safety ecosystem um, that all of the things that are going on in the Internet of Things space and in, in the cloud space and everything else, um, that we can really transform public safety and emergency response in the United States. If we think about it on the front end, and if people who are working on these things <coughs> also think about emergency communications as they develop these things. So ideally where we want to be, I think, 
is seamless data collection, processing, and delivery. Now, this is no different than anything else. Like, when I was thinking about this, in my mind, the future of public safety is a lot of data, tons of data, way more data than just a simple 911 call, right? Um, but lots of data being collected, lots of data being processed, things being done to the data uh, that are, you know, attaches to the 911 call <clears throat> and provides context beyond just the voice that you're hearing on the other end of a call or text for that matter. Um, and then transmitting that data to the 911 center, but not, again, not just to the 911 center, um, to other entities in the emergency response chain so that they can do something with that data. And of course, that's that collection of data, which is gonna happen not for public safety per se, it's gonna happen for whatever reason that data is being produced in the first place, which is probably not for an emergency response, but for some other purpose. Um, and then whatever processing gets done with that data, it's only relevant if there's an entity on the other side that can actually receive the data. And today we have a real hard time in the 911 just getting location data into the 911 center with newer technologies. And so there's obviously a lot of work that needs to be done on the 911 side of this as well. I guess I should also say, if I say anything that you think is just wrong or it's already been solved and I didn't know about it, please just say it. Uh, and hopefully this can just be a discussion. I'll throw some ideas out there and hopefully we can have a, a discussion about it. Um, so, I, I was reading the, the President's National Security and Telecommunications Advisory Committee report on Internet of Things before I came. And it's, it's more from, as you would expect, it's from, the, it's from a perspective of national security and yes, there's benefits to IoT, but we're really concerned about all the really bad things that could happen and things being taken over if it's not handled correctly. But, I, you know, I've read it and I, I agree with what this says, which is we basically have an opportunity to maximize security, minimize risk. We have an opportunity to take advantage of all the benefits while avoiding all the pitfalls that potentially come with it. Um, and, and that's where we want to be. And I, was, I read a NIST thing on the way here, too, where it was talking about firefighters. And basically the whole gist of the thing from the perspective of the firefighters on here was the more data we have, the better. Right? Not, about the building, about what's in the building, about what's around the building, about what's happening to my body because I'm in a fire and I may not know, you know, what, uh, what my, my vitals are, but some sensor does. And so the idea was the more data, the better. Uh, and I think that's where we want to get. So let's talk about where we started. I did this this morning. I'll do it, I'll do it briefly here. We had voice only, right? Um, and I'm going to start with, you know, the telephone era. I'm not going to start with pre-telephone. Let's, let's skip to like 1965. Um, we had voice only. We had, I like this term, citizen activated emergency response. So you would, you would dial a phone number to get to your sheriff's office or your, your police department um, or maybe your doctor. And it was a seven digit local phone number, right? There was no 911. We didn't introduce 911 into the system until 1968. It had nothing but voice, but it worked, and it got from the, telef the telephone company ran it, and it got you to a 911 center uh, or to an entity that answered 911, um, and that worked. And so then we decided we would add some location data with it, what we called enhanced 911 or E911. And for the next, you know, well, I actually was talking to them this morning who told me there's still some counties that don't have E911 in Illinois on the wireline side, yes. which was disturbing. Um, that we don't have it wireline E911 ubiquitously across the country, but we basically do. Most areas have wireline E911 at this point. And that just means, you know, when you call the phone, when you dial 911, it shows up with your voice and your address. And that was pretty simple, right? Your house isn't moving very often at least. Um, and we, we were able to do that. Then we introduced wireless into the equation in the early 2000s. Uh, we started deploying 911. Um, and then, VoIP in 2005, I think, was when the FCC required 911. Um, in that case, not an automatic location, a registered location, since the, or at least for the nomadic kind of Vonage style VoIP uh, services. Um, and then most recently, uh, we just recently required text messaging to 911. Um, and in fact, it wasn't until 1999 that 911 actually became the universal emergency number. It was a piece of legislation called the Wireless Communications and Public Safety Act. Um, which made 911 the universal number. So here's, here's my experience from, um, from the early days of the nonprofit public safety organizations I've worked in. We've, we've cons consistently had a 
I would say an adversarial relationship between technology and emergency communications and public safety, at least on the 911 side, uh, maybe less so to, on the first responder you know, communication side. We've consistently retrofitted new technology into an old system, right? On the wireline side, we weren't retrofitting anything, right? It was like, here's the telephone system. I'm AT&T, the telephone company. I can figure out how to dial 911 and make it reach a certain location, and it worked. But then we came wireless. It wasn't set up for wireless. It was set up for a fixed location system. We had to figure out how to trick it, trick essentially trick uh, the system into routing a, a mobile wireline, a wireless call to a to a, a local 911 center. Same with VoIP. It wasn't, uh, the system wasn't set up for, for a voice, voice over IP type of 911 system. So it's constantly been retrofitted. Same with text. Now we have text messaging. Um, and in each instance, the Peace app of the 911 center has had to request the service from the provider. So the government comes in and says, you wireless carrier, you VoIP provider, you text provider, you shall provide this service, but only until the 911 center asks for it. So the 911 center has to do something on their end to retrofit their system, which wasn't set up for that purpose. And then once they say they're ready, which there's 6,500, but is that right? 62, 65 uh, 911 centers. <clears throat> and so then they do whatever it is that they're going to do. They pay some company to set up their system. Um, and then you know, it enables the, the wireless call to get in or the text to get in. I think, I think there's a couple hundred, there's like maybe four or 500 piece apps at this point who have said to the FCC they're capable of taking in text. We're talking about. Literally, just the text. No location information, just the fact that uh, you know, you're able to text 911 and somebody can read the information. So it's been a slow process. That's been going on for a long time. Um, thanks to a lot of people who are at this conference, um, and many who are not, we're, we're moving forward to a next generation environment, but it's been slow. Locally managed and controlled, I mentioned. Um, you know, and, I, and if anyone was at Henning's talk this morning, there's, there is over 6,000. They're all very much locally controlled, locally managed. Um, they tended in the past to be very proprietary uh, solutions. Um, and what we had was a system where you had an individual. So I, I, am in, I need help, or I see somebody who needs help. So I'm the one entity. I call 911. I talk to one individual on the end, other end of that call. The most they possibly have at that point is my location, either my, ad my address if it's a fixed location or um, an estimated location if it's a mobile technology. That's all the data they have. The only other data they have is whatever I tell them over the telephone, right? And then that individual dispatches information out to some entity who's going to respond to that call. Um, and that could be a combination of you know, radio or uh, some kind of data that they send out to the responder. And so that was, that's, that's, the, um, that's the extent of data involved in the emergency response. Um, even when we have data, this is the point I want to make. So a good example is um, crash data. Everybody know what automatic crash notification is? Anybody know what it is? Okay. So. Um, OnStar is an example, and I'll use that as an example, but it's not the only one. Uh, Mercedes and BMW and other companies also have crash data. So this is not new. Um, going back to um, two, the late 90s, early 2000s, it was called telematics. Um, and they have sensors in the car. This is sort of, it's almost like the, the, in my mind, one of the original Internet of Things applications, which measured a whole bunch of really cool stuff. When the car crashed, whether I'm conscious or not, and this exists today, it knows where I am, it knows where the car is, it knows that there has been an accident, and, and it's got a whole bunch of data about it, that it rolled over or not, that, it, that the airbags deployed or not, how fast the car was going, the delta velocity, so from essentially 60 to zero, sort of what that force was. Um, and that data has existed for over 15 years. And none of that data today, if there's a crash, can actually be shared in electronic format, at least, to my knowledge, with the 911 center. Now, you would think, how hard could that be to solve, right? We ought to be able to figure out how to do that. That's a known entity with a known set of data with a knowable universe of people that we want to share it with, just on 911. But to my point earlier, a lot of people on the medical side would probably like to have access to that information, too, before they treat the potential patients. Um, and so it was, it was kind of fun 
when I was thinking about what I might say today, I went back and looked at a project called the National May Day Readiness Initiative. I mean, who puts that many words on one slide? This is ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, somebody's got to have a talk with me. Um, <laughs> Now, what I, so I did this on purpose because it was, it was kind of fun. So I went back and read the report of this thing called the National May Day Readiness Initiative. So NMRI, as we called it. This was the first thing I worked on when I, in the public safety space. It was really fun. So it was DOT, and um, they, they paid our organization, ComCare, to run this process. And it was, it was about that issue. It was sort of the infancy of this automatic crash notification stuff. And it was... Let's figure out you know, like how to create a standard and how to get all this data and who wants it and how to get it to them. So we made these recommendations. First thing we said was that the, the whole emergency communication system was gonna be moving towards an internet protocol based system. You would have thought that that was the craziest thing in the world to, to suggest. When we said that the whole thing's gonna be based on internet protocol, it's gonna be IP based. You, you can't talk about internet protocol and public safety. That's not a proven technology. Are you out of your mind? Um, so we did anyway, um, and we talked about, as you can see, intelligence in the networks, sharing of information in real time. And we talked about voice and data in the network with location, going to the PSAP with crash data, with location, with a map, with the phone number, with medical records, um, to a PSAP. Also to trauma centers, traffic operation centers, because wouldn't DOT want to know where the crash was before, any, as, soon as, as soon as possible, et cetera. And we talked about uh, data on a call center server, e.g. personal medical data, could be picked up and added to the data being sent to a PSAP or an EMS agency if the subscriber had paid a TSP for such a service. TSP is telematic service provider. So this made me chuckle a little bit. Because in our mind, like, it would be such a controlled system, right? You'd have this, this OnStar or this telematics provider would know about their customer. They'd have a special subscription service that their subscriber could pay for with their medical data. And if they did, then you would provide that data to the 911 center along with the call. Whereas, that sounds silly to me today. To me, it would seem like some other service would exist with information about me that was a totally separate service provider. Uh, and then the question is, well, how do you get all those disparate data sources together about the same event? Which is what I hear a lot of people talking about at this, at this conference. Um, and we, we wanted this private sector to do cool stuff with the data. So I don't think that's really happened. And is anybody, Henning or anybody else, am I wrong? Has there been a bunch of developments there? And it's crazy. So, so what I can say now today, though, I'll just say it now, even though it's later in the slides. There's some progress. So OnStar, to their credit at least, they have what they call an, an injury predictor, an urgency algorithm. Um, and so they will, when they get one of these crashes, based on certain data points that the CDC has done some pretty cool research with, with like the nation's leading trauma surgeons, like really high level trauma surgeons that look at the data associated with crashes from all these different sensors in the vehicle. And then they, they created an algorithm to figure out uh, likelihood of severe injury. Now, if you think about it, if we could get more and more and more data, you could, predict, you could do more than predict the likelihood of severe injury. You might be able to predict what injury Right, if we have enough crash data and enough outcomes based on certain types of scenarios. And that's right, I, I hope we get to. Um, but today, at least OnStar is able to tell the 911 center, you know, there's a 75% chance that we're gonna have a very severe injury based on this data. Uh, and it's based on rollover, and, and they, they add other things into it, like whether it's a male or a female, um, whether the person is over 55 or not. If you're over 55 and female, I'm sorry to tell you, you're more likely to be involved in a serious injury than if you're a young man. Um, that's just what the data says. Um, and similarly, what kind of car it is, right? If it's a Fiat, that's going to be different than if you're in a Dodge Ram, whatever. Uh, and seat belts, yeah, exactly. Airbag, all that stuff. So, so they're able to do that. But what's funny is they don't send any data to anybody, even today, right? They don't send the data to the 911 center. They certainly don't send it to the doctor or the, the hospital who might f like to know some of that information. They just verbally relay that there's a, a high probability of injury. Better than nothing, I suppose, but I hope, I hope we can do better than that. Okay, so where are we headed? Um, and if anybody's been involved in some of the discussions in the emergency communications track, you will have heard some of this. Um, we're, we're headed to a next generation 911 system, which is, uh, I'll talk about in a second, which is what I, my favorite part about it when, when I first started learning about NG911, it was the first time that we weren't talking about technology as a problem, new technology, because that's, that's what I used to hear. Ah, you know, wireless 911 or text messaging. 
this is it's it's a pain in the ass from the 911 side, right? Compared to the the the, the ease and it always worked of wireline 911 calls. In the NG 911 space, we we finally said, you know what? No, let's take advantage of the new technology. Let's not think of it as our adversary. Let's think of it as a potential solution to make our 911 system better. Um, now we have a long way to go, but we're at least headed down that path. There's a lot of great work being done. Um, greater use of shared services and cloud computing. One of the things uh, we used to talk about was whether or not you could do um, hosted computer-aided dispatch systems, um, you know, hosted solutions for 911 and public safety. And again, that was kind of met with a, are you sure you want to do that? It's how do we control it? Um, and I think we're headed in a direction where we're going to be taking advantage of shared services for 911 and emergency communications, which is a good thing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, massive amounts of data. So to me, the thing that's interesting is, so the crash notification thing I just talked about, that's, that's data collected for a specific emergency response related purpose. Right? That's why you collect that data. Whereas all kinds of other data is being produced not, not for emergency response, whether it's Fitbit or whatever, um, or um, any other uh, number of applications and sensors that are out there you know, measuring whether there's a leak, a gas leak or a water leak um, or anything else. Those aren't being collected because they're thinking in advance, oh, we're going to use this for an emergency response situation. But they, they do exist, uh, and they are being collected. And the question to me is, how do we take that data, put it together with uh, other calls and other information that is specifically about an emergency to create a, a, a greater picture and, and get a better outcome? Um, so more data sharing. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of data security and privacy risks that now come up with a much more open uh, 911 and emergency communication system than in the past. And we have a lot less regulatory certainty now about how all of this works, who's in charge, who gets to say how this works, who can say you're in trouble if it doesn't work. Uh, and so there's a lot of questions about um, sort of who's manning the ship. And that's something the FCC is paying a lot of attention to these days. Um, you know, they've, they've, they have only historically, I'll talk about this a little bit at the end, but they've, they have historically, the FCC, had a role in telling a wireless carrier, because that's who they have jurisdiction over, you shall provide 911, or a, a messaging company that connects to the public switch network, you shall provide text messaging. Um, so they have not, and do not, have a, a relationship with local 911 authorities um, but to the extent all of this is IP-based, to the extent all of this is interstate, not intrastate communications, the FCC is um, thinking about what its role is and what needs to be done to make sure that the system works. Um, and there, I, I can tell you, the Public Safety Bureau at the FCC is very concerned about, it's, it's like they want, they want to see the technology flourish, and they want to see next generation 911 work, and they want it to be fully IP based, and they want it to be based on the most modern technology, but they also want to make sure it works 100% of the time. Um, and it's an interesting dichotomy, because they're on the one hand pushing this stuff as much as they can, but at the same time expressing concern and issuing giant fines to companies when it doesn't work. Uh, so it's, it's interesting times that we're in. Okay, so I won't talk too much more about Next Generation 911. Uh, there's been other discussions about it today. Um, all I would say is, uh, and actually, there was a quote from Chairman Wheeler the other day that I thought was relatively accurate. He said, to date, the transition to NG 911 has been too slow and too ragged. That's his words. Increasing overall cost and risk of failure while leaving us well short of our goals and improving emergency response and saving lives. Now, that's, you know, he's on the bully pulpit and he's trying to encourage more deployments to occur than have occurred to date. There's also been a lot of really great work, some of the stuff done in this state, Indiana, and other states across the country. Um, NG911 is being deployed. But, Henning, you did a thing this morning. What did you say? How many states do you think have deployed NG911 at this point? 13 or so? Sub state, some, some portion of the state has, yeah. yeah. So, like said, yeah. Um, what about, what about in Indiana?
And so the and so that's and so correct me if I'm wrong. So we have sort of an iterative process. So you have NG911 deployments, meaning originating service providers, wireless carriers, text providers, etc., can then connect into this newer IP-based infrastructure. Okay, so it's still a kind of a combination of old and new, the legacy with, with, and to my knowledge, while the newer NG-capable systems could take in video, pictures, et cetera, we're not there yet, right? They do take those in from certain over-the-top From certain over-the-top apps? Okay, so we're scratching the surface, though, in terms of, even where it is deployed, in terms of the, the full, so, you know, I talk in here about what the system is supposed to be capable of doing. Few are actually doing any of that. Uh, and then I think it's safe to say most states are, a lot of them are in the planning stages, but we're certainly not at a, at a next generation 911 sort of ubiquitous uh, uh, state in the country. Maine. Okay, statewide. So there's a handful of actions that are going on. They've done testing, but they're not interconnected. They did do testing, and they had successful. Okay. And this is important because everything I'm, everything I'm about to say won't work unless there's, it's like you can't play baseball without a catcher who has a, a, a catcher's mitt. I just made that up. We'll see if that works. Um, right, like you can have a great idea and a great pitcher with a great pitch, but if there's no catcher there to catch it, it doesn't matter. And so we have all this other data that's being produced, some of it specifically for emergency communication, some of it not, as I said. But if we don't have a system on the, on the receiving end that's capable of taking, a, taking it in and receiving it, it doesn't really matter. So massive growth in video, this is a Cisco stat. Um, mobile video traffic exceeded 50% of total mobile data traffic for the first time a couple years ago. It'll be three-fourths of the world's mobile data traffic in 2019. So cl in, I don't, actually it's funny, when I call my mom and dad now, I use FaceTime every time. I don't know why, that's odd. Um, I don't like the phone at all, but for some reason I'm okay with the video chat. That doesn't really make any sense. Uh, yeah. How, what is what a violation of your privacy? Because when I got in 911, the only information I have, I provide the information I want to send you. Yep. I provide the location because they have to do that. Yep. But I provide the information I want to give to you. So the system is taking the information they can't give. So you, if your question is, are there privacy concerns about information beyond location? Yes. I would because say. For example, you share in the car have songs in the way it was So you can't, you can't, if it's crash data, there's a specific law that provides an exception that uh, does allow the owners of that crash data to provide that information during a, to, when they're contacting the 911 center. There's a specific exception for that. But to your point about uh, is there privacy issues around other things besides location, yeah. There, I, I, I think that is a fair question. But today it doesn't happen. Right today, you're call, you're making a call or a text, and all, the only thing that's going through is location. And there is a specific carve out in the law, in the Communications Act, that does permit wireless carriers and others to provide that location information. There's also some language in the federal law about liability protection that extends to it's, uh, not just traditional carriers. There's a term in the law called other emergency communications providers, which is kind of a forward-looking effort by Congress, so that. Folks who are providing information beyond just a traditional call have the liability protection if something goes wrong, even though they're trying to do the right thing. But if your question in general is, if we start bringing in a whole bunch of information beyond just the voice call, is there a privacy issue there? I would say the answer is yes. Uh, and that's something that policymakers need to grapple with. Yeah, Mark.
Right. Yeah. Yeah, there's, a lot of this stuff does kind of vary on a state level. And, and a lot of the laws, so you said the word call. How, what is a call? How is call defined? Right? So there's a lot of d nuances that people have to be aware of. Yeah? Yeah, but also, I mean, it, it's a bit of a nuance, but when you give call or dial 911, the only thing that's going on is the call is coming from your device to your mobile network. The fact that you've dialed 911 and what your phone number is. The only thing that the mobile carrier sends to the 911 center is your phone number. That's it. There's no data, there's no nothing, no location. The 911 center takes your caller ID, makes a secondary query, this is over a separate communications path, where is this phone number located? And that's a point-to-point, -point. so it's a two-legged point-to-point communication. No location data ever leaves this device, ever. For now. I don't realize that. I mean, it's a nuance, but from a legal. For now, though, I mean, I, although if anyone was in the demonstration earlier, they're talking about trying to use the device itself for the location. There are ways to go over the top to get that, but that doesn't exist today. But people are concerned about, oh, this device is sharing location. And I think it's important to realize it doesn't share anything with phone number today. Although, yeah. Yeah. No, I don't. No, so I think there's there's state laws on on what is or is not permitted, or, or when you call nine one one. I think that's that some level of discussion needs to be had within the, the legislation about what is or is not permitted, depending on what we want to do. But I want to do a whole lot more, so let's talk about that. Um, so, I was at the airport. Someone broke out his Periscope app. I don't, I'm, I'm not technical enough. But all of a sudden, he's doing a video chat with me. That's fun. And all these people just started popping up and, and, and were video chatting. And so, and, that, and Meerkat, I guess, is a, is a competitor of that. So that, that level of voice or video-specific communication is obviously growing very fast. Um, and he, can, he was able to just start video chatting with pretty much anybody. Now, he certainly could not have taken that video chat and then connected it to 911. Although, that's why we're developing these NG911 systems, so that he can. And that's fantastic. What's, um, what's interesting to me is none of those talk to each other, right? If I'm on Periscope or Meerkat or FaceTime, is there stand, uh, do those communicate with each other yet? No, right? They're very closed, right? Which is kind of the opposite of the telephone network. And so it's funny because we're going from a closed sort of proprietary 911 system to an op a more open 911 system where the actual services we're using is much more closed. When, and they don't interoperate with each other, which is interesting to me. Um, and then, of course, there's non-real-time video. I can take a video of Mark right now, not listening to what I'm saying, typing into his phone. And, and I could, yeah, right. <laughs> and I could, and I could send it to anybody in here, but I certainly couldn't do it to 911. But we're getting there. Um, somebody talked about connected car yesterday. How if the car crash? So again, if there's going to be if there's cameras inside cars, uh, for whatever reason. So even if I don't have it associated with the service, but I dial 911 on my phone, can I somehow have my phone connect to the camera in my car to then have the image that's being taken of me transferred via my car to my cell phone, my smartphone, whatever it is, into the Peace app? I don't know. Seems like it ought to be doable. But there, again, there's, there's video everywhere. Obviously, there's video in my home. There's video in malls. There's video in the streets of Chicago and Washington, DC, where I come from. Um, and so that, that's. An interesting development, <clears throat> and hopefully the system will be able to take advantage of it. I already talked about automatic crash notification, um, smart baby seats. Um, you know, I think the Internet of Things app that I'm most excited about is the self-propelled lawnmower that I was reading about. Um, I don't think there's an emergency response connection to that, although I could imagine there might be if it doesn't work right. Um, but smart, smart child seats. Uh, I have two kids. Um, I hope I never leave one of them in my car and forget about them in a hot Washington, D.C. summer day, but I might. And so these, these things have a lot of information. Now, does that need to go directly to the 911 center? I don't know. Um, if it can't reach me, I hope it goes somewhere to somebody that can come help them. Um, so, there's, again, just sensors everywhere. Um, 
obviously people talk about the, the leaks uh, at industrial sites. That information is interesting. I changed the spelling of the word plane here. The version that's online is spelled P-L-A-N-E. Those are not flying floods. I just uh, spelled it wrong. Um, so anyway, Internet of Things, there's data everywhere. To me, the biggest, the thing I think about the most is we have trouble getting specific data specifically for emergency response into the response community. We have trouble getting it just to 911, at least we have historically. And we are hopefully are working to get that handled. There's going to be increasingly a lot of data that is uh, not designed for emergency response, but that could be useful during an emergency. And the question to me is, and I'm, there's so many smart people around, how do you take that data that isn't specifically for emergency response and use it to add context to a 911 call or a 911 text? Because the devices that are around that emergency uh, you know, can understand the, how that data can be used. So wearables is an example. Um, you know, heart attacks and strokes are um, one of the main killers in this country. Um, wearables, Fitbits, they're not, again, they're not designed for emergency response. They're designed for some individual health use. But my hope is that we'll be able to use that information so that when I call 911, it's probably the same damn device, right? It's this Apple Watch that I'm wearing to call 911 is also connected to my, my vitals. If it's going to call 911, um, and 911 can receive that information, first of all. Can they also receive that information right, that's, that that same device is measuring about me? If it's not that device and it's some other device that I'm wearing, um, like an oximeter or whatever it's called. My wife's a doctor. I asked her how to say that and I forgot. Um, but it's a thing that measures your, your blood oxygen level. It's, you know, it's just a piece of information about me. Um, and maybe it doesn't need to go to the 911 center. Or maybe it goes to, it's, it's a package of data that's available when I call 911, the 911 call taker is not going to do anything with that, um, most likely. Although, you know, emergency dispatch protocols can be changed based on information, so maybe they maybe they can do something with that. But if that data is available, can they then provide it not only with the location of the emergency, but can they then provide that when they dispatch EMS, fire, police or EMS? Um, I think the answer has to be yes. It could be done, right? If we just if we if we wrote a 50 million dollar check and got all the smartest people in the room together, could they make that happen? I'm sure they could. Um, it's, it just has to be a priority. And so I was listening to the keynote this, this morning, or this afternoon, earlier today, um, and it was essentially about just thinking about what you want to achieve on the front end, among other things, and then working to achieve that objective. Uh, and my hope is that we can, we can take advantage of all these Internet of Things applications, all these wearables, electronic medical records. I figured I had to have one image since it's all just words. Um, and clearly we're, we're using electronic medical records more than we have in the past. Um, frankly, we have to because to get reimbursed via, via Medicare, hospitals and doctors have to use them. Um, so again, that's, that's data about me known somewhere. And when I'm asking for emergency response, I'd love to make sure that um, if it's helpful that somebody in the, EM, in the, EM, the EMT or, uh, has access to it or that when I get to the hospital, they have access to it along with what other information has been added to this emergency event. Um, so. Uh, okay, so a couple quick thoughts and then I'll conclude. Interoperability. I don't know how McKinsey comes up with this stuff. At least 40% of potential benefits can't be realized unless the Internet of Things is interoperable. That sounds good. So I hope all these different sensors, my, my thing, in a, in a public safety setting, let's make sure that we think about how all these different sensors and Internet of Things apps are being developed and how they could potentially benefit public safety. And that requires us on the front end those who receive the information, can they get it? Those who produce it, are you letting people know in the emergency response community that it exists and how to get it? And those in the middle doing things with all this data, putting it together, packaging it, so that it's all useful uh, in an emergency response. Um, I thought this quote was interesting. It was after South by Southwest this year. It was an analyst basically saying, we're collecting vast amounts of data, more than we ever have, yet we don't use any of it. Um, and I think she was just talking about like an enterprise, right? Forget what I'm talking about, which is a whole bunch of disconnected sources of information that 
aren't aware of the other sources of information. We're talking about, let's say, an oil rig that's, connect, that's, that's producing massive amounts of information, and they're actually only using a tiny fraction of that information. Um, so I, to the, as we start using more, I hope we use more for public safety, and I do hope it creates new business models. Okay, last thing I'll say is, of course, there are public policy issues here, um, and that's what I do for a living, uh, living in Washington, D.C. There's a whole slew of unique funding and, and, and 911 specific issues that are attached to next generation 911. We talked about privacy already. Um, data security is our, obviously an issue. So I've heard a lot of people talk about privacy is dead. It's like social or, and, and data security is dead. I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not. And I, I understand the concept, but I can tell you one thing when it comes to Washington DC, it's not dead. Um, there's a whole lot of discussion going on um, in, in Washington about the Internet of Things and about privacy and about data security. And the reason there's so much to talk about it is it's cool, right? The Internet of Things is really interesting. Uh, it sounds neat. Um, and data and privacy are easy to understand. And to the extent that there are data breaches or there are privacy violations, that's, that's something that lawmakers really care a lot about. And so um, there is an Internet of Things caucus on uh, Capitol Hill now. Uh, it's got a, m over a dozen members. Um, the good news, I think, on that front is that, that those members are pushing the Internet of Things as, as a positive, right? They're not, it's, not a, it's not a sort of how do we control this. It's a, this is a really amazing thing. Let's talk about developing a national strategy. There was a, a resolution passed by the Senate this year, a sense of the Senate talking about the need for a national strategy on the Internet of Things. I don't know if that's a good idea or not, but I, it certainly shows the level of interest uh, in the United States Senate about the Internet of Things. Um, liability, I add that here because uh, while I mentioned that there are some federal laws at least that provide some level of liability protection for those who essentially uh, create information for emergency response, it's not rock solid. So to the extent we're, we're moving forward and, and taking advantage of all the new information that's available and trying to use that information for emergency response, um, we do need to think about making sure that people are incentivized to do that and not disincentivized because if something goes wrong, they get in trouble. Uh, we, I think we want to encourage technologists uh, and, and pe people to, to think about how to use data for, for the right reason. Governance issues, obviously. It's, it, it got complicated as to who's responsible for what when we started talking about voice over IP 911 calls. Is it an interstate call? Is it intrastate? Does the state PUC regulate VoIP? There's still debates going on right now, I think, in Minnesota about whether or not the, uh, the cable companies in that state are subject to state jurisdiction or not when they provide voice over IP service. And that's telephone service. So when we're talking about applications and sensor data and doing all these interesting things that I hope happen, uh, the governance issues there are extraordinarily complex, uh, and that's something that we're going to have to grapple with. Um, and there is no one owner. Uh, I'm more familiar with what's going on at the federal level, just to give you a sense of what is going on, cases of interest. Um, NTIA, which is the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, is the president's telecom advisor. Um, they have taken an interest in the Internet of Things, um, and but they and they've. But they haven't done anything. They formed a couple working groups. They're looking right now at facial recognition technology, concern over privacy and other issues, and drones. That's another popular topic in Washington these days. A lot of hearings on drones uh, and a lot of concern about privacy issues, et cetera. Um, I will say that there is some focus on specific applications like connected vehicles. Senator Markey from Massachusetts is quite concerned about the ability of connected cars to be hacked and taken over, so there's legislation there. Um, the FTC, I would say the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, is probably the most, uh, the agency with the most focus on the Internet of Things right now. Uh, they just put out a big report. They did not recommend legislation, uh, although the, they did recommend legislation on privacy, although bro more broadly speaking. Um, and then you have uh, as I mentioned earlier, the FCC focused on NG911, focused on the open internet, a lot of activity going on net neutrality. If anyone has questions on that, I'm happy to discuss it. Um, and trying to figure out what the FCC's role is in all this. 
And then, of course, there's sector-specific interests, like DOT is interested in traffic-related sensors and things like that. Um, so I think I'll just end with this. On the one hand, from my world, at least in Washington, you have the chairman of the FCC. This is a speech he gave to APCO, which is a public safety association, just a couple months ago. Um, and he's essentially been trying to challenge the public safety community. And this was, this was about next generation 911, which is important. But as I say, I think we need to think even beyond 911 to all of the entities involved in the emergency response chain. Um, but you have the sort of positive uh, push to try to get us to think creatively and to deploy next generation systems, uh, even though it's going to be difficult. On the flip side of that, you also have a lot of people who are freaked out uh, about the bad things that can happen with technology change. At the consumer level, um, I mean, we're having debates about whether or not telephone companies should have to get permission before they um, turn their copper networks off because copper is line powered and you know it's sort of a known technology whereas a fiber based communication system to your home is not and so when the power goes out you don't have power like you did under the old system so we're having these debates just about consumers as technology change uh, happens um, and then when you start talking about sensors and devices and everything connected <clears throat> everything literally connected um, there's a lot of concern about security issues and data breach and everything else so uh, in a nutshell, to wrap up, um, everything that's going on in terms of Internet of Things and uh, cloud computing and WebRTC and all these things, is that the right term? Um, I, I see it as extremely valuable and an amazing amount of potential if that technology is harnessed and all of those data sources are thought, if we think about how to use all those data sources for a modern emergency communication system. Um, I didn't talk about FirstNet. I think there's going to be a presentation later today or tomorrow on FirstNet. Um, but that's another very relevant uh, development in terms of trying to get a uh, modern, uh, interoperable, nationwide, high-speed data capability, um, mobile broadband capability for all the first responders, being able to take all that information we're collecting and processing and providing it to those in the field uh, seamlessly. Um, the opportunities are endless, and I hope we take advantage of them. And I'm happy to take any questions about that and ideas. Yes. So there's two things going on, as far as I can tell. One is the chairman himself is engaged, as well as his public safety bureau chief. And, um, and Henning, please pile on here, based on your experience at the commission, um, is very engaged and wants to use, I think more than previous chairman, the bully pulpit to sort of push, and also to push Congress to the extent there's anything that can be done at the federal level, even if it's just funding. Um, very engaged. At the same time, there's a, pr there's a proceeding going on right now at the FCC. It's a 911 governance proceeding. And it raises all these issues, right? What's the role of the state? What's the role of local? What's the role of federal? And it's not uh, a proceeding in which uh, there's a bunch of una unanimity, let me tell you. A lot of different perspectives, depending on where you sit on that. Uh, if you're state, local, or federal, if your companies, it's a lot, there's no clear answer there. But it's definitely something that's teed up, and at least there's a dialogue happening. And, and, and I guess where I'm coming from, I'm the IOS side. And, and I think a lot of the uniformity and a lot of the unanimity that's been brought in the Said, Bow shall make all the steps to 
Yeah, and there's a. There's a point where if there was willingness, even small amounts of money can leverage large amounts of behavior. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a separate process going on, as I'm, some of you know, at the FCC, too, about PSAP optimization in terms of the architecture of the system. But again, I don't want to limit it to PSAPs. I want to talk about, I want to make this a broader discussion about other entities involved in the response, not just the 911 center. And it makes it harder, but I think it's silly if we just keep talking about 911 without talking about the other entities that are involved. So they're dabbling, right? They, 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 they had a hearing. What is the Senate doing about anything? Nothing. OK. So uh, they're dabbling. They had a hearing this year. Um, they, have, they passed a resolution that, in fact, I think I have it right here. I'll tell you exactly what it did. It did four things. It uh, calls for the United States to, one, develop a strategy to incentivize the Internet of Things. It's a good thing the Senate's on the job. <laughs> Otherwise, what would you people be doing? <laughs> Two, prioritize accelerating the development and deployment of the IoT in a way that recognizes its benefits, allows for future innovation and responsibility, and protects against misuse. Recognizes the importance of consensus-based best practices and commits to using the Internet of Things to improve efficiency and effectiveness. It's a resolution. It's, it's putting a marker down. Hey, we're interested in this. Let's make sure we use the Internet of Things for good things, not bad things. Whereas Senator Markey has a specific bill that calls on the DOT to, sp to take steps to avoid cars being hacked, essentially. Yeah, um, that, that's, that's what's going on there. All right. All right, thank you very much.